the next big uh, topic in our workshop today, and that's the generative model, which is our way of unifying all the supervision that's provided by labeling functions. That's what you guys have been working on all morning. Now we'll look at, it, at jumping from a single isolated labeling function to how we unify all these sort of weak signals to arrive at an estimate that we can then use to train another model um, uh, that we'll talk about even later this afternoon. So again, I, I like to open with these terminology slides. We'll talk a lot about a generative model and the discriminative model. Um, generally, a generative model learns the joint probability of some uh, variables. Uh, this would be something like a 90 phase classifier. While a discriminative model uh, learns the conditional probability of some uh, y given x. And this would be uh, more probably the classifiers that you guys actually use in every day, which would be like SVM, support vector machines, uh, logistic regression, and then all the deep neural network stuff. So I'll say a lot about generative models and discriminative models. This is sort of the conceptual um, sort of like formal definition. Broadly, the generative model is what takes all of your LFs and learns a single marginal probability that we then feed to a discriminative model, which in our case is some deep learning LSTM, which we will talk a little bit about what that means, but for now you could sort of think of that as deep learning magic that does cool stuff to learn features for you given huge uh, sets of labeled data. Of that. So just to review, a lot of this is what Steven said this morning, is that labeling functions allow for radically weaker supervision to be used to train a model and these can come from a variety of all kinds of noisy inputs. This would be um, knowledge bases, classify other classifiers, weak classifiers, ontologies, crowdsourcing. And labeling functions ensue, uh, subsume and encode all of these forms. But we really don't, we haven't talked so far about how you go from all these multiple conflicting and agreeing votes to some sort of single uh, you know, label that we can use to train a discriminative model. So the simplest way you could imagine sort of adjudicating or uh, unifying all of these LFs would be something like unweighted majority vote, right? All the functions you've been writing so far vote um, essentially one, negative one, or abstain. You could imagine just taking the majority vote for each label and using that as your hard label to train um, a classifier with. And uh, the intuition here is that as long as most people vote um, correctly, great, in this case greater than 50%, adding more people actually improves the accuracy of majority vote. And this is a um, long uh, hit known historical theorem called Corsay's jury theorem. And this sort of forms the intuition for you know, when we think about how these sort of uh, uh, systems of agreement work, how we should approach them. But the thing about unweighted majority vote is it ignores the fact that individuals have latent unobserved accuracies. And like sort of Steven's example earlier this morning, you might walk to a, a workshop and see a panel of experts. And you know that generally everybody's right, right? They're, they're, they are experts in their field. So they're generally giving you uh, better than chance answers. But some of them are probably a little better than others, right? And we'd really like to be able to use that information to inform a prediction problem. And we can think of these, that, that degree of betterness as this unobserved latent accuracy that is, lives with each expert. And in our framing, each expert is here a labeling function. And what we do is we wanna learn these latent accuracies without necessarily having labeled training data. Um, and we wanna do this by just looking at the degree to which uh, labeling functions overlap and conflict and reinforce with each other. So the, the sort of flux capacitor here that uh, uh, makes this possible is our generative model. And what you can think about this is that there is a latent variable, a latent true class variable for every candidate that we're attempting to make a prediction for. And we can associate some parameters on the edge of this, um, this is like a, a graphical model, factor graph representation. We have some edge that models these accuracies that connects to the outputs of all the labeling functions that we've been writing. And the idea is we wanna maximize the marginal likelihood of these LFs to learn the parameters of those edges, which we can do intuitively by looking at the way that they overlap and conflict with each other. Okay, so that's sort of the intuition. Okay, so I'm gonna explain to you with actual labeling functions that sort of are doing different things by voting, and then we're gonna look at what the scores come out when we look at a generative model. 
So I wrote um, a couple labeling functions. Hopefully you can see them here. Um, one just encodes this idea of marriage, which we were talking about this morning. And this other is this almost married, which is um, engaged, or boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, et cetera, et cetera. And then I've made a simple labeling function that matches those terms. I use the standard distance supervision one from the uh, demo. I made a new labeling function called soon, which uses these almost married terms. And then I do a union where I look and say, if you're in the knowledge base, and you also have this term marriage show up, I'm gonna vote true. And then I'm gonna have this contrarian, which just says, I'm gonna, if you're in the database, I'm gonna vote no. So I know you should be married, but I'm just gonna vote no. So this is the complete contrarian. So it's gonna not agree with a lot of the labeling functions. And then we can just ignore this. This is some syntactic sugar to make sure that um, the names uh, uh, sync up when we, when we train our model. So we should know from as you guys have experimented with this marriage example, that the, the husband, wife, spouse, partner, that tends to be a pretty low precision labeling function, right? Like husband and wife show up a lot in this corpus. They show up a lot between person names that have no um, spouse connection. So it's super noisy. And doing the composition with uh, distance supervision uh, makes it uh, you know a little less noisy. Um, but what we should expect is that these all have some sort of latent accuracies of how much we should trust these models. So for the generative model, if you guys open up um, workshop three, I won't have you run this here, but if you want to follow along with what I'm doing, um, I basically loaded all of the labeling matrix that, that, that we computed. So that function that, that applied LFs to um, all of our candidates and generated a matrix that's stored to the database these function cells pull it out so that we can take um, a look at it and use it for other purposes. In this section, we have a majority vote where I just do my sort of the simple unweighted majority metric where I say, I know the true ground labels for the dev set. Let's just take a vote of those four or five functions I wrote and just explain to you. And if I do that, I get an F1 of 32.29, so 32.3. But we know from how I built them that one of those is just like totally wrong. And one of them is pretty bad and pretty noisy. And it'd be nice that, you know, based on how they sort of agreed with each other, that the model should be able to sort that out and we should be able to do a better job with just the LFs alone. So that's where the generative model steps in. So uh, what we do here is um, we load these labeling function matrices that we've computed and we do a search over the parameters of possible configurations. So if you guys have done machine learning before, you know that a lot of these models are, can be finicky and need a lot of tuning. Um, and the tuning uh, takes place in all of the sort of knobs and levers that you have to pull and set to be able to configure and optimize your machine learning model. And the process of picking the best configuration there is called um, hyperparameter tuning. And one approach to that is to simply do something called grid search, where you enumerate a space of possible parameter values, and then you explore that space by running some number of sampled models. So for the, the generative model, um, I'll go a little bit more about this. We, we explore um, a pretty small um, hyperparameter space. Epochs is the number of times we, we train on training data or pass through training data. Um, here again, the training data is the labeling function matrix. And then we have this decay parameter, which is just um, how model weights are updated over time. So if um, you have a decay factor, uh, things will be updated a lot at the beginning, but then they'll tend to taper off as you train the model longer. And that's so that we don't end up bouncing around a lot as we continue training our model. And then uh, uh, step, step size is a similar deal um, where you just, uh, the, the factor by which you update weights after coming up with some estimate of your uh, error or loss function, your gradient. So a little bit, um, uh, I say all this just so you know kind of what's going on, um, but I wouldn't really change any of these parameters in your notebook when you run the generative model. This is pretty tuned. We've done some experiments, so this does a pretty good job of finding a reasonable configuration for you guys in a reasonable amount of time. So this computed with my um, four or five functions or whatever in about a minute, right? So this is a nice, you can sort of hopefully start seeing 
that you develop your LFs in Notebook 2, and then you run and run them in the generative model after taking a snapshot to arrive at their sort of adjudicated value. And one read on that is like up here above with the majority vote. And then we run the generative model, and you see that we're getting uh, another assessment of performance here, right? So if you'll see immediately, um, we're doing a little better on the dev set already just by training the generative model. So we're at uh, 37.2 uh, for basically any of these configurations that we selected. So we're almost, what, five points better than the majority vote? And what we see there, um, this doesn't quite bear out in the learned accuracies, but um, what we're seeing is the generative model is learning to properly discount that contrarian voter who's really dragging down the majority vote. And that's exactly the type of phenomenon we would hope the generative model could sort out. And this is sort of an extreme case where the, we know that that is a completely pathological labeling function, but that happens to some degree in all the labeling functions based on how they agree and disagree. So we want the generative model to, it, at worst case, it'll do majority vote again, but almost always with properly tuned LFs that aren't totally pathological, you'll do some degree better. And we see this time and time again in all the empirical experiments we do is that running through the generative model gives us some percentage lift over majority vote, which means we're properly learning some estimate of these latent accuracy uh, parameters. Okay, does that, gen does that sort of big picture intuition make sense? This is, a, this is a good concept to sort of start familiarizing yourself with because the generative model's job is to denoise these weak supervision signals you're providing, right? And the end product of this generative model is after it's denoised all of these LF inputs, it'll compute a probability for each candidate, okay? And that's what um, uh, this particular function does, is that you can print the stats out, uh, which is similar to the previous notebook, where it just lists the, the names of the functions. And there are various statistics, including the accuracy is measured on uh, the training set, and then some estimate of the accuracy based on the generative model. Um, I wouldn't, uh, this is sort of, this metric is a bit in, flux, like um, we're probably not looking at enough data, and those labeling functions are probably don't have enough coverage to really get some good estimates of these uh, values. So I wouldn't put so much faith in this, um, but I would put faith in how well we're performing on uh, our uh, dev set. So I would say like the, the values that come out when we actually fit the model to something. Um, and we're ostensibly tuning to the dev set, so we'd expect it to do a little better, but see that even here, um, even it's sort of invariant to our configuration of hyperparameters. Like it sort of does a good job immediately uh, denoising um, our supervision. So it definitely, it's, it's non-convex, right? So it's not, yeah, it's, it's an open theoretical question to characterize all the critical points, but um, under some reasonable assumptions, like you've got a certain number of labeling functions that are sufficiently, uh, give you a sufficiently high quality, um, it, it'll look convex in the region around the true answer. So um, uh, the way to think about this is, is uh, two local optima are um, sort of the, the correct weighting of the conjecture two optima are the, uh, the correct weighting of everything, and then the mirror opposite of that. So you can't tell if everyone's telling you the truth or everyone's lying to you, right? That, and so what we're doing is we're breaking the tie one way, right? We're gonna say that because you wrote it. Yeah, and that assumption's reasonable, right? Because most people do pr make labeling functions that aren't, like there are better than chance, right? right so exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're assuming that yeah. you know, we're using domain knowledge to write good labeling yeah. functions. Cool. Okay. Um, so right, so I'll just explain these other two um, sort of mechanistic things, and then we'll go back to the lecture to explain some more um, things you can do with the generative model and labeling functions. So I just want to say uh, one of the more useful outputs aside from just your uh, performance on the development set using the generative model 
is plotting a distribution of your predicted marginal probabilities. And this is saying, I'm going to take all of the marginals I learned from my training set. So, you know, I, I'm applying your LFs to this set of unlabeled training data, right? I'm taking the generative model to unify the supervision and learn the respective latent accuracies of these labeling functions, and then use those learned accuracies to arrive at some denoised probability per candidate, right? That probability is the marginal probability. And this function will generate them for every candidate in our training set. And if you plot these, you'll see a distribution between zero and one. And what you should see when you immediately see this is that uh, this is a, uh, not a particularly good distribution. So what this is saying is that everything is really centered at 0 0.5, right? And that means that I haven't really labeled anything. And what that tells you or should tell you is that 20,000 of my training candidates are untouched by labeling functions. So my coverage is pretty bad, right? So to train a good model, you really will need a, a better sort of coverage metric. And we'll show you some slides of what are good marginal distributions and bad, so you, you can come up with an intuition there. But this is a good sort of stopping sanity point. So when you are, are writing more, when we revisit after this lecture to tweak your labeling functions, and when you actually run through the generative model, a good snap check is to look at this distribution and see what it looks like. And if it fits the, the one that I'll, um, we'll talk about in a sec, um, you'll know you're doing a, a good job. And if you see this plot, you'll know that you don't have enough coverage and you should probably add some more labeling functions. All right. And here I can do, um, this is just the formal score. Um, so this is analogous to um, uh, modulo that we tuned on the dev set, but we see we're getting like five points higher than majority vote on the same set of data. And that's what we'd hope to see of uh, the generative model. And the last bit of thing to run would be um, the saving our training labels. And if, if you notice, we, we have a pipeline here. We have labeling functions, label candidates to generate a matrix, a label matrix that's stored in the database. Next uh, notebook, the generative model, loads that label matrix, learns some weights, and then generates some marginal probabilities, which we then save to our database. And then we'll use them uh, later to train our discriminative model, which will be the sort of final in model of this system. Okay? So it's important that when you, when you do um, every step of the way, make sure you run all of these cells in your notebook. Otherwise, you're not going to save state properly. And the next notebook in the chain is going to break. The other thing worth mentioning, um, this is box work, so feel free to interrogate him uh, completely on this area. But you might have noticed as you're writing these labeling functions that a lot of times uh, they are saying a, like very similar things, right? So if you wrote a labeling function that looked at a, a window to the left of your candidate, do you pick one word? Do you pick two words? Do you pick 10 words, right? Those are all sort of like nested uh, dolls of predictions, right? So they're all sort of saying the same sort of stuff. So one of the assumptions of data programming and snorkel is that you know, labeling functions vote independently, right? And we're sort of breaking that assumption when we do these sort of like explorations of spaces, when we, we have a single hyperparameter to tune, like window size, or maybe if you do a lot of biomedical stuff, like which most of us will be doing in this room, you'll be using a lot of ontologies, right? Well, these ontologies don't exist in isolation. They have huge amounts of overlap and they may, you know, one ontology may be a superset of another. These are all sort of not independent in the strict sense. So you might think this would be real cause for concern um, for just adding functions willy nilly because the problem there is that when functions aren't uh, independent, you tend to overweight their accuracies when they're, you know, everyone's sort of voting in the same way. That was how it used to be. Um, now, thanks to some work that Bach has done with some collaborators, is you can actually, we've built into Snorkel this ability to detect these dependencies automatically and sort of um, learn a generative model that takes these things into account. And according to his paper, which um, just was accepted in ICML, is ICML done yet? Did you present it? <laughs> Oh, no, uh, it's a couple weeks. Okay, a couple weeks. So uh, it's on archive. There's a great blog post. I'm putting the link here. Um, although there's tons of great blogs associated with um, Hazy Research, uh, you should check it out. But it just is sort of gives you a free boost 
um, in, in performance for virtually nothing. It's super fast, and uh, as I said, um, it, it corrects for this problem where data programming assumes that things are voting independently, and uh, we can actually correct for this tendency uh, of, of resources and supervision to sort of reinforce and correlate with each other um, just by how those resources are built. And uh, just to make this concrete again, again, this happens a lot in ontologies. And this happens a lot when you have tunable parameters that you want to explore. And they're sort of better, you know, there are different ways to deal with these types of problems, but one way is to just throw everything in and sort of let dependencies sort out how they correlate. And there are tons of other cases I'm not thinking of, so. Great, so one thing I'll show you is how to train um, with dependencies, and then we'll do a hands-on where we'll take uh, the notebooks that we have, uh, you guys have written, and we'll try to train the generative model. So if you look at the uh, bottom of this notebook three on uh, structure learning, this little single block of code is actually what does all of the magic with picking dependencies. Um, in this case, you'll see that on my data set, it runs super, super fast, right? So it found eight dependencies. Uh, there's some tunable parameters here with setting your threshold. Um, you can explore that as you wish, uh, but by and large, maybe something like 10 are reasonable. And what this generates for you is a set. It is based on an input of your labeling function matrix, which generates this set of dependencies which then to use, all you do is pass in to the uh, generative model up here. And then you can rerun it. Actually didn't test this, so it would be nice if it gives a boost, so. So sometimes, so it, generally it doesn't, it doesn't hurt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But without any tuning, without any tweaking, it maybe it's a little too much to hope for, but um, yeah, I'm sort of curious. But. And sometimes it won't do anything if there aren't actually any correlations. Yeah, exa exactly, right, so that's a fair point. So, right, sometimes you don't really truly um, have dependencies, in which case. I should have thrown in a bunch of correlated windows or something, but anyway. So, what you want, which, so this, you're, you're gonna, everyone's gonna run their generative notebook and it's almost certainly gonna be a uh, marginal distribution like this. Like you're gonna have low coverage and you'll have some sort of some negative signal, some positive signal. What you really would like in sort of an ideal world is this much more bimodal distribution where you have a lot of uh, good negatives, a lot of good positives, and then some just indeterminate center in the middle. This is sort of like fake, but it is fake, and they generate this data. But you want it to look more like this than this. And um, the degree to which you can get away with a lot of uncovered data is a little problem specific. But in general, you, you want to you know, have reasonable coverage um, of your model with labeling functions. So let's go ahead and open um, notebook three, and then go in and try running end to end. We'll walk around helping people. And when we're all to that sort of first pass step, um, we can sync and uh, move on to refining our labeling functions.